are officially criminals whether you like it or not. Yeah. So that's, that's my in. I would very much like to see a change in the law. When it does, I will have to find a new job because if cannabis cultivation is no longer a crime, I can't study it as a criminologist. But I'm on your side. Um, I've been researching cannabis cultivation for 20 years uh, now, which is kind of terrifying. Um, and specifically, my research is cannabis, it, 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 it's the cultivation. It's not the use, it's not necessarily the, the politics. It is, I've always come at this from a perspective of people who grow cannabis. Um, just out of interest, how many people in this room do or have grown cannabis? Way. <laughs> <laughs> I, might, I might just finish there, actually. Yeah? <laughs> Um, <laughs> I wrote a PhD uh, on cannabis cultivation. Uh, it's been published as a book. It's a great book. I think you should buy it. Um, that book was called Weed, Need and Greed. Uh, and the point of that title was that when I was investigating cannabis cultivation um, for six, seven years, participant observation, ethnography, whatever that means, I got involved. Um, it was clear that there's a lot of people in the UK growing cannabis. That's the starting point. From a criminological perspective, that was interesting because the assumption up to then was that drugs are imported. But actually for cannabis, we produce far more than we import. And we even export cannabis from this country, which we should be proud of. Uh, we export to the Netherlands, we export to Ireland, we export to other places as well. Um, but we need and greed. The point was that I found three broadly different but overlapping groups of people involved in cannabis growing. There were those that were characterised predominantly by the concept of weed. They loved the plant, the drug, the ideology, the culture that goes with the stereotype of, of, of cannabis users. They're the weed growers. There were also the greed growers. They were the people that were more like traditional drug dealers who were in it for the money. And then there was this group in the middle, or not in the middle, this other group, the need growers which essentially were the medical people, the people forced into cultivation because that was a preferable way of getting their medicine than having to go to the black market or than not having any medicine at all. Um, so that's my history. That's finished that PhD far too long ago. Um, more recently, I've been involved in the Global Cannabis Cultivation Research Consortium. That was a group of people from 13 countries around the world all looking at cannabis cultivation in their own countries. And we found in a number of countries, North America, Europe, Australia, Israel, New Zealand, we're getting the same thing. Regardless of cannabis being illegal, lots and lots of people getting involved in growing their own. Some of them just for recreational use, but a lot of them for medical use. Not that those two things are necessarily easily separated from each other, um, more of a spectrum than, than sort of completely separate categories. Anyway, more recently, in the research that we're talking about today, uh, me and my uh, beautiful assistant, Axel Klein, uh, <laughs> who you'll meet in a moment, um, we went to, we got some money from the British Academy Lever Hume Trust. Um, that is essentially government money, but they let us do what we want. We're not tied to any political or policy or, you know, there's no pressure for us to say what they want us to say. We get to say what we want. Um, we wanted to revisit how had the UK situation changed since I did my original PhD research? And given that there's been changes in cultivation technology, there's been changes in the understanding of medical use, uh, there's been changes in policies in other countries that mean people in the UK can point to California or Spain or Uruguay and say, if, if there, why not here? So we wanted to look at what had changed in the UK uh, over the 10 years since I used to do research. Um, and that's kind of the thing we want to talk about yeah, today. Um, we had to recruit people who were willing to respond to our interviews. And of course, because cannabis is illegal, lots of people are a bit shy about talking to researchers. The number of times I've been accused of being a cop um, is uncountable and it's kind of amusing. Um, but there you go. Um, luckily, a number of people in this room helped us to recruit respondents. Uh, there's a few people in this room I've met before, but anonymity is key, so we won't go down that road at the moment. Um, but we got given some money and we've been interviewed. We interviewed 48 supposed to be 50, we didn't quite make it. Some people aren't always reliable when you arrange an interview and they don't necessarily turn up or whatever. But we interviewed 48 people in the UK, 
not all from the medical background, uh, some of them from other um, backgrounds into cannabis cultivation. Um, and today we were going to talk specifically about two narratives that have come out of our research. So one of them is this, how the, the campaigning movement, the medical campaign movement, which is the main thing about you guys here today, how that's changed in the UK. Uh, and then I'm going to pass over to Axel to talk about that, but then reminding everyone that it is still a crime and that has implications and connotations that are really important to address. Uh, so we're going to let Axel talk a bit about the medical stuff that we found and the campaigning stuff, and then I'll be back once you're bored with him. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, I should start with an um, apology, a clarification and uh, explanation. The apology is, um, you were expecting a beautiful assistant by getting me. I've, I've never been described like that before, and I think it's probably the last time too. Um, the clarification is, when it comes to government money, I think we should always clarify that it's actually taxpayers' money, so I think it's probably a good thing that we're investing in getting a different angle on cannabis cultivation from what you normally get. And finally, the, the uh, correction is we've got 49 interviews, so we're just one shot, <laughs> uh, and it's ongoing. So what, you know, we set out really to look at how do people reconcile their cannabis cultivation with running an ordinary life, with, you know, we, we heard it earlier, with neighbours, you know, how you win them over with tea and cake, I think, was most of it's the way into your neighbour's heart. Or how do you, if, if you run a family, how do you organise, how do you reconcile that? How do you balance it on the one hand, running this, this illicit activity with having a normal family life? How do you associate with, with your friends and so on? So these were the things we were quite interested in. And also, and how do you separate your own activity from the criminal act organizations around you? So these were initially our interests. But what we then found is many people contacted us, asking or but volunteering to participate, often people wanted to, to tell their story. And they very often were, uh, were growing cannabis for medical reasons, either for themselves or for a loved one. And this took us into an unexpected and a very interesting direction with, with the research, but also with the general sort of policy reform project that we are both sort of interested in, in and committed to. But talking to people, we thought there, there were a certain sort of narratives that, that we found again and again. And the first was that people had, were diagnosed with conditions like uh, MS or fibromyalgia or Crohn's disease for which there wasn't a known cure. Very often there wasn't even a proper diagnosis. And this, at, at this point in time, when we grow up with the sense of entitlement to health, where the National Health Service is close to a national religion, it's very difficult for people to find a place where they have a, uh, have a condition for which there is no cure. And where you find that your relationship with the medical profession is actually quite tense, you feel almost you've been betrayed, you've been let down by the medical profession. Via various avenues, people then found cannabis through friends or through their own discovery and found they got some relief. But when they wanted to go to the pharmacy and find, pharma, find the medicine that helped them, they couldn't because it is, after all, a classified substance. And the ban has been put in place by the government. The government that's supposed to be look, looking after them, but the government that actually guarantees your right to health and your freedom from pain. That's a constitutional right. But it's been betrayed by your very government policy. But you can find cannabis, as all of you know. You don't have to go far, you can buy it. So, so people started buying on the black, or what they in Nigeria lovingly called the white market. <laughs> so you can buy this cannabis on the white market, you can buy it readily and easily, but it's often involved with hassle. As all of you know, you might have to hang around, there's often the process of humiliation, it's very difficult to guarantee the supply, the price, the quality. And for people who have a medical condition, often it's very difficult to obtain. And it's only after sort of we find that the, the, the white market doesn't work for you either, that people moved into cultivating, often hesitantly. But then the next thing we found is that people were really quite developing and, and upskilling and becoming enthusiastic cultivators who really understood the plant. And many, well, a number of the people we interviewed, 
were very concerned to have the right inputs because after all you put this thing in your in your body. So you want to make sure that it's organically grown, you know what's in the soil, you know the number of lighting hours you use, you know also what strains you use. And people were, were modulating their, their strains very carefully. I remember one informant telling me, oh, um, uh, I'm smoking this cushion at the moment, it gives me a nice edge, takes the edge of the pain, but it, I can still carry on doing stuff. Or other people, I think somebody even in this room telling me, no, I really like Northern Lights because they know it, it really deals with the pain very effectively. So people knew what they were doing, what, what they were using, and they've got, had a really nuanced understanding of it. And it's that sort of expertise that, that, that we were really interested in. Also, many people were aware of the scientific research. They had read Professor Barnes' report, so the uh, all-party all parliamentary group. They were also uh, abreast with publications in, in, in different journals, but they were extremely frustrated by not being able to hook up with researchers and uh, having their plans in, analyzed, having a proper relationship with the research community. And this is something that, that really is missing. There were, there's also something what I'd like to call a cottage industry. Uh, we've got a few small producers, and a lot of people are producing a bit of oil, a bit of edibles, but it's, it's a cottage industry, it's quite small, and a lot of it is done informally and, and, and through the sharing economy. So people will often look towards somebody who's got their own condition and get information from somebody in a similar position. And it's that patient-to-patient -patient medication and support, which I think is really quite interesting. It's, it's, it's opening a new dimension to, to healthcare and, and, and medicine. But what I, what I think uh, is quite important for the reform movement is to really take stock of where the, the, the whole sort of field sits at the moment. We've got a lot of expertise, we've got a lot of need, we've got a lot of knowledge on it. There's also bubbling up a small economy, but it's really quite small. And this is something that when we were, we were having a conference, we both happened to be in Amsterdam, so Gary and I met in a coffee shop and compared um, <laughs> notes. And we were talking to a colleague who was talking about a small operation in Colorado that his sister was working in. Small operation was 1,800 plants. <laughs> and, we, and we realized now there is this, this in, in the States, this industry is really developing quickly. And, and it's a new biotechnology sector where they're de developing all new different strains and applications for. And in the UK and other parts of Europe, we're just missing out on this. And I think. We really need to conceptualize this as an argument and take a focus and say this is an opportunity you're missing, both economically but also from a healthcare perspective, but both these arguments need to be forged. And then the other interesting thing I thought is now that we have organizations like the UPA or the UK uh, kind of social clubs and so on, as people become organized and sort of out themselves and come out there and, and, and vocalize their demands but also become open about their own condition. Um, we find there's a, there's a movement, and with that movement, not only do we change the image of the cannabis user, the cannabis user is no longer a hedonist, somebody's immature and irresponsible, but somebody with a medical condition, and I think we can really change the political argument for it. But also, we change the status of, can of cannabis. Cannabis is no longer a menace, but it is actually a medicine. And with that, I'll have you. Yeah. yeah, I think we can take a lot of... Um pride and hope from actually the fact that so many people are already becoming activists. You know, the, the campaign movement is growing strongly. That's why we're all here now and here and will be again, and we've heard some great stuff about that. Um, but again, going back to my background as a, as a criminologist, I mean, we have to remember there is still a dark side to all of this. Um, that many of us are forced to break the law and are labelled as criminals every day. And then weirdly, and again, criminologist hat rather than can cannabis campaigner or user hat, many of us choose to get involved in more serious crime as a way of avoiding more serious crime. Because you either buy your cannabis from the black market and you're supporting criminals, or I did some research in Northern Ireland, you're supporting paramilitary groups of some kind. So instead we choose to cultivate, we choose to supply, we actually deliberately choose to commit more serious crimes, at least from the perspective of the law. Um, and actually 
should, we should also be honest that some people then also realise they can make money and they do end up becoming maybe the thing that many of us are opposed to. But some people, I'm not saying people in this room, but we know there are some out there, do become actual drug dealers. I've certainly talked to some people who have complained about how some of the people claiming to supply medical users are making a lot of profit and are maybe ripping them off and not supplying with what they say they're supplying. And then that encourages those in this room and similar people to, to redouble their efforts, to actually say, no, there is a moral market, there is a, uh, there's, there's a fair trade market, if you like, and we're going to seize that and keep that. And that's, that's great, and we should be proud of that, but it does mean we're becoming more serious criminals uh, than we were originally. But there's more. Actually, some people in this room I don't know, but being involved in cannabis cultivation also, for many people, leads to victimisation, because there are plenty of examples of people then suffering robbery or burglary or violence because actually your grow room is known of by smell or careless talk or whatever. Um, and people who have to be held up at gunpoint, I had guys held up by machete at the throat or gun held to girlfriend's head because other people are stealing their crops. Partly because they know that these people, us, if you like, can't easily go to the police to report victimization in those circumstances. So that's a further escalation of criminality. In this case, it's becoming a victim but of other types of criminals, if you like. Um, and then I've met people, and again, not necessarily people in this room, who have then found that they have essentially had to employ violence or threats of violence to protect themselves against the violent criminal element that are preying on them because they're growing cannabis. Yeah? I don't know if anyone in this room has been in those circumstances, but we probably know of people who have been in those circumstances. Um, one of my favourite interviews, not in this room, and I won't mention names, but was um, a 50-year-old single mother um, who was growing, primarily, yes, making some money, but single mum, son with autism, so it was just supporting him, being able to provide for him, rather than using the drug medically for him. There's a kind of sympathy there, but she had a local gang knock on the door and say, we know you're growing cannabis, we insist that you give us some of the money. We're going to tax you, essentially, charge you rent. Um, she got out a baseball bat, went out and smashed up their car in front of them and said, yeah, bring it on. Which was kind of... I kind of moved towards the door at this point in that interview. But, um, but the point was that forced, you know, because of the law, we are forced into greater criminal activity and exposed as victims to greater criminal activity. Aside from the fundamental problem of not having access to medicine. And I think that's another debate to bring to the campaign movement, to recognise that essentially the criminal law itself, or the anti-drug laws, the anti-cannabis laws themselves, actually cause a lot of crime. Not just that they criminalise us, but they actually cause other types of crime. So they were the two big things that came out of our research, the great side of, of campaigning and activism and how the medical users are reclaiming this and rebranding themselves and the drug, and that's great. But also the dark side to all of that, how because we're operating in the current legal framework, the actual criminal side of things is, is problematic for us, but also for other people. Other people get roped into or get exposed to uh, organised crime elements or what have you. Um, so that's kind of, I think we're partly trying to get back a bit on schedule. So that's kind of the summary of what we've been doing, and we intend to carry on doing more research, and I'm going to pass back to Axel um, to, uh, yeah, yeah, to do that. <laughs> Just to close off, I mean, we've got 49 interviews out of 50, and because we've got closure for you, we've been dragging this out for, for months and months, you know, because we just don't want to say goodbye to it. But what we're really going to do as of tomorrow is put some funding applications together, and we would really like to take it forward, because that argument about the, the contradictions that are inherent to the legal situation, I think they really need to be they need to be amplified and they need to be disseminated. People need to know more about this. As somebody said earlier, people need to realize that this is an urgent issue. It's an urgent issue for the, the people who've got a medical need, yes, and that needs to be, people need to make noise about this, but also that people are being criminalized and that this is an opportunity for the emergence of small scale criminal groups who can make a parasitic living by violating the rights of cannabis cultivators. Again, I think these are important issues that we really would like to make, make noise about. But we need more data. So we will be hopefully um, in, in contact with you in order to get more data about your own experience. 
both how cannabis is used, how cannabis has helped you or people you know, and about your own cultivation experiences. So hopefully uh, we'll be in touch.